In a previous video, we mentioned how the weirdest looking chameleon ever of all time had to be the Namaqua chameleon. And looking back at it, yeah, that chameleon is still pretty goofy looking. But that was before we learned about the genus of Ramfolion. You might see, for instance, a Ramfolion Maspictus and think, oh, big deal, another lumpy green guy. I eat those for breakfast. And to that I would say, you eat chameleons for breakfast? But I would also say, what about the Ramfolion Rubho? The chameleon that fluctuates between looking like a chopped log and a mossy tree branch. Or what about the Ramfolion Princier, who has a silhouette of a mirrored teardrop? Or what about the Ramfolion Colomani, who looks like if a sopping wet dog was a reptile? Now, those are obviously funny enough guys to devote a whole video to, but let's let's zero in on my favorite of this genus, the Ramfolion Beriducci, or Beriducci's Pygmy Chameleon, or the Mahenge Pygmy Chameleon. Most people who keep reptiles, if you tell them you have a chameleon, their immediate thought, oh god, do they know? That's because the, the popularly caught and sold veiled chameleons and panther chameleons tend to be on the finicky side in terms of their tolerance for keeper error. If they're kept in a glass enclosure, they drop dead from too low of ventilation or airflow. If you keep them in a mesh enclosure, which is the more recommended option, they might dry out and die. So as a result, they have the image of being a kind of weak species to keep. No offense to them, of course. But the thing is, Baraducci's chameleon lives in a mountain range specifically the southeastern Mahenge Mountains of Tanzania, on the Mbarika Mountains. Mm -hmm. They specifically live in forests on the mountains at around 1,200 to 1,500 meters, or 3,900 to 4,900 feet above sea level, which is just high enough for the biome to be classified as a montane forest or a mountain forest, where the minimum altitude is 1,000 meters though their population is confined to four small patches of forest since the surrounding area of said patches is mostly agricultural land. Thankfully, that's really their only threat. The IUCN Red List considers them to be a vulnerable species, uh, specifically because of their limited habitat, which generally means that the species is vulnerable to whatever changes these small patches of land might go through, whether it's due to uh, human intervention or natural disasters. So basically, Hopefully they don't experience any fire, tornado, tsunami combinations anytime soon. Though, based on their location, I would say the Beriducci chameleon's biggest threat is mudslides and forest fires. Specifically because these fires are of rather high elevation, hence the mudslides, and also high humidity, hence the mudslides, um, but also the Tanzania pattern of rainfall throughout the year fluctuates between a drought um, and like monsoon season. So this unpredictability poses a bit of a threat to the chameleons. So what is it exactly about this particular section of the Mbarika mountain that the Baraducci's chameleon finds so interesting? Well, the funny thing about the entire Ramfolion genus is each chameleon within it has its own body plan specifically designed for its own mountain. When I was naming all of those species for you earlier, what I didn't name was their common names, and that was intentional. That's because uh, it would have revealed a bit of a trend in all of their common names, uh, as the Baraducci's chameleon is also called the Mahenge chameleon and lives on the Mahenge mountain range. Ramfolion maspinctus is also called the Mount Mabu pygmy chameleon. Uh, for being on Mount Mabu. Ramfolion rupo is also called the rupo chameleon for being native to the rupo mountains. And Ramfolion princii is also called the Naguru pygmy chameleon. Can you guess why? Yes, it's because they live on the Naguru mountain. Yes, yes, that's all very interesting. They have mountain names, whatever. But the chameleons are only reflective of a greater trend in the entire ecosystem 
of these mountains. Each of these mountains holds unique conditions that foster even more unique animals that live inside of them. The fact that these chameleons only live in their respective mountains is crazy. I mean, look at the population trends for a majority of lizards, hell, reptiles as a whole. You'll find them spanning Nigeria to South Africa, from southern United States to central Canada. The only times you see distribu distribution this isolated is in island populations. That's why the Mr. William R. Branch, Julian Bayliss, and Crystal Tolly have dubbed these mountain forests Sky Islands because they are so tall and also have the biodiversity, but also the ecological isolation of an island, despite not technically being islands since they are very much inland. Uh, if you're interested in the topic of islands that aren't actually islands, then I would recommend Atlas's pro video, Islands That Aren't Actually Islands. Nice title. That's actually the video where I heard about all the pygmy chameleons native to Tan Tanzania. So please do check it out. Something funny about terrestrial chameleons as a whole. They can't exactly change colors to the same degree as your, for instance, veiled chameleon or panther chameleon. They can change color a little, mostly fluctuating from green to brown. All of the colors that they can change are just desaturated to fit with the background. But for the longest time, I also thought that all chameleons gave live birth. Turns out, no, just Jackson's chameleons, and maybe uh, a secret other species that I'm forgetting right now. But similarly to a majority of chameleons, Baraducci's chameleons are oviparous, meaning they lay eggs. Um, here's something curious. Although the genus as a whole share quite a bit of superficial similarities, there's one element that they all differ from extraordinarily. That is the shape of their hemipenes. Now, for those not in the know, uh, ripped. What the hell? Okay. So, yes. Um, for some reason, it didn't actually record the latter half of the video's footage when I was recording that day. Um, I thought it did. I I was definitely reading the lines, but I guess it wasn't captured. So, I'll just do the rest of it from here. Basically. For those not in the know, hemipenes are uh, the dual penises of species with cloacas. So essentially, when you have clo uh, cloaca, your uh, sort of reproductive technology, if you're a male, um, and yeah, if you're a male, requires you to have two very distinct looking penises. But technically, they're not actually penises. I mean, if you talk to the average herpetologist and call them two, two penises, the, herpet, the herpetologist isn't going to like correct you and say, well, Aram, actually, technically, they're not uh, actually penises because the sperm travels on the outside of the body, which is, I mean, like, yeah, that's true. But I mean, it's kind of like how, like, no one would correct you if you said insects had brains because technically they do but technically they're not actually brains insects don't technically have brains because their like neural network is kind of concentrated throughout their whole body rather than just in one uh central organ like how we have but they do have one central organ that also works in addition to the neural network throughout their body no one's gonna tell you like no they don't actually have brains because, I mean, they kind of do, but technically they don't, but they technically do. With hemipenes, the way they tr uh, transfer sperm, the way they move it outwards is thanks to what's called like a sulcus spermaticus, which I'm not actually sure like what that looks like or how it works because I haven't seen any footage of it happen. I would love to, but I haven't, um, and I'm not sure that kind of thing can be captured since during mating it all happens internally because that's the point of a hemipenes is it's hidden inside the cloaca so although i might not have seen the sulcus spermaticus what i have seen are the uh very unique in like hemipenal structures that all of the different species within the ramfolion genus have within their you know, they're junk. Let me read to you the uh, a quote from the Wikipedia article on hemipenes. This is interesting. Uh, Yet, despite this assortment of hemipenous designs, no association has been found between the design of the hemipenes and the disposition or danger of the animal. 
Rather, it is believed that hemipenes found in the squamate or lizard uh, world exhibit such diverse designs to facilitate mating compatibility amongst individuals of the same species, a theory that is referred to as the lock and key mechanism. Citation needed. Yes, a citation is needed. Um, where did you hear about that? I, I want to read about it. Holy shit, what? <laughs> because, like, that makes sense. That makes so much sense. Because, yeah, it's not limited to the Ramfolion genus, but within even just that genus, all of their, like, genitals look so different. Like, insanely so. The, the, the rows of, like, teeth, or I guess spicules, as they're called. They're called spicules or spikes or whatever. You know, like, it's all in completely different formations. But within, it, it's not like, like a fingerprint where each individual member of the species has, like, a separate fingerprint. Or, I guess, separate, completely different looking penis. Um, but, like, it's... Uh, th it's it's only different between the subspecies and it's crazy how different they are and a lock and key mechanism makes so much sense because i mean that must mean that like the females of each of those species have completely different looking like vaginal structures as well which i haven't seen holy shit hold on why has no one ever shared like like we have tons of sketches scientific sketches of like what the hemipenes of the ramfolian genus look like nobody's made any sketches of what the hemivaginal structures of the females look like hello why don't we have those um i would love to see it because then that would basically prove or disprove the 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 theory there of the the lock and key structure which is I mean, that's just a funny name for it, but at the same time, it conjures such a specific image that it's like... Yeah, no, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, like, that 100% makes it clear to me what they mean when they say mechanical isolation. Because previously, I had no idea what that meant. You know, I, 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 I mean, I had a vague idea, like, okay, mechanical isolation, I guess they have, like slightly different junk like i didn't know that it, it differed to this extent but like yeah it's because not all, all keys fit in not all locks you know anyways moving away from the genital talk uh one of their common names well as well as their scientific name uh their scientific name being ramfolion baraducci and their common name being uh the baraducci's chameleon um was named after the famous italian herpetologist joe baraducci um Though Joe Berducci was not the one to discover the chameleon, that of course was uh, Mr. Jean Miro and Colin Tilbury. The Berducci's chameleon was discovered around the same time as the other Ramfolion chameleons um, on their other respective mountains in 2006 on an uh, herpet herpetological expedition made by the two. The future, the ecological future of the Berducci's chameleon is uncertain. Uh, not just because of like how evasive and small they are and they are small they're like they're like around half the size of your thumb so like around 28 millimeters or half an inch they are extremely like difficult to it, it is extremely difficult to get a hand on or to, to get an idea of what their wild populations are like hence why we don't really know how many are out there but just because of how vulnerable they are in the four small patches of land that they have, it's not looking good, especially with how much deforestation has been going on on the Tanzania like mountainscapes. So not great, but we honestly don't know. One of the other Ramfolian species, the Chapman's chameleon, uh, has so far become like critically endangered because the like population numbers of the Chapman's chameleon are similarly separated into four disparate segments throughout uh, a mountain and what that's basically done is separated all, or I guess isolated a lot of genetic diversity for that species so as a result they've had to start inbreeding um, which is not good for a species long term because the more inbreeding that happens within the the the, uh, the I guess genetic tree of a species the more you'll see a lot more genetic defects mutations shorter lifespans and so long term for a species the inbreeding is not good I'm hoping that the same is not true for the Baraducci's chameleon but 
I mean, they have a lot of this, a, a lot of the same kind of problems in terms of their areas of isolation and the populations being so segmented and not being able to reach each other. Nah, it's not looking good. And aside from that, uh, that's kind of all we know about the Verducci's chameleon. I mean, there's a lot that could be said about their, you know, uh, their their general morphology, such as the island dwarfism phenomenon and how that's very funnily uh, taken place on their mountaintop. Um, or, I mean, that's kind of it. Like, we don't we don't really know that much about the species. We don't even know what bugs they eat in the wild. I mean, you could guess based on like the bugs that are native to Tanzania, but we haven't really seen them eat necessarily so we don't know but uh, I did a lot of digging in terms of like basically every research paper that was written about the Ramfolion species um, and I couldn't find much about the Berducci's chameleon specifically let alone the whole of Ramfolion so not great but this is all the information we have on them uh, I like this species I think uh, Baraducci's chameleon is a very sweet little little guy, sweet little guy, and uh, they're very interesting. I mean, terrestrial cha chameleons in general are pretty cool because they're like way outside the norm of how chameleons usually are in terms of being, well, one, arboreal rather than terrestrial, and two, uh, like the key trait of chameleons that they're known for is the color changing and terrestrial chameleons can't really do that to the same extent so it's like they're, they're funny in that way but aside from that we don't know much but i would like to know more but they're very cool and i love them and shout out and shout out tanzania as well and the ranfolion genus and the Berducci's chameleon okay uh, see you next time, and goodbye. Goodbye. Thanks for sticking around this far. Uh, I know we haven't posted in, like, forever, um, but that's... Yes, I would like to start doing that more. Um, a lot has changed since the last time we posted. Uh, f like, for one, the like alter headcount has gone down from like twenty-two to two. For two, we also kind of um, kind kind of like lost faith on the platform of YouTube. We've been getting a lot of comments about like about pronouns in the videos that that really messed with us like our entire videos that were sometimes like like nine to ten minutes to like 15 minutes long discarded in favor of a negative comment about a 20 second sec section where we listed the the pronouns that we used other than that thank you to everyone and uh we really appreciate like i mean all the support from everyone so thank you a lot and um when's gonna be our next upload that's a great question um yep and i'll see you next time and okay now goodbye for real this time okay goodbye <laughs>